Hey, my name is uh, Tom Pyle. I was an instructor through a full, full professor at SOC, SOSC, SOU from 1969 uh, through 2004. I officially, officially retired in 1998, but I did six years of uh, part-time after that. So about 30-some uh, years. And uh, primarily taught journalism, also got into uh, areas such as freedom of speech, and I was advisor to student publications, both the newspaper and the yearbook. Well, the technology was, change was huge, uh, because uh, in advising the publications, I had to deal with buying equipment and so on, and trying to be up on equipment. And we're moving from typewriters and what was called letterpress printing into computers and paste up printing and then on total, total computer uh, managed things. And, and I didn't have much knowledge in that. <laughs> and so a lot of the times actually I was relying on the students to tell me what was going on <laughs> as far as the advancements uh, in computers. The Siskiyou was printed at the Daily Tidings. Uh, the Siskiyou offices were on campus and they moved around, well actually just twice uh, that I'm aware of, uh, from the basement of Brit uh, into the uh, basement of the Stevenson Union. But they, um, being a student publication, as with, was the Raider yearbook, uh, the offices were in student activities buildings. I remember the first computer, I can't say for sure the year, but it was a um, something 64. Commodore? Com um, Commodore, I don't think was quite right, but it was something along that line. And um, I bought that solely on the recommendation of one of the students on the staff. <laughs> and uh, at, with, with advising publications, I was pretty much in charge of all the finances. And uh, as the Siskiyou became more modernized, we did have to do an awful lot of buying of computerized equipment. Our first um, machine that we actually had on campus, other than the uh, little computers, was a, uh, I can't remember what you actually called it, but it was a machine that we bought from the Daily Tidings that would uh, print out the stories and so forth on paper, and, and so you could be, they could be pasted up and then photographed instead of using uh, hot metal letterpress type. And so I um, had a big battle with the purchasing office over that because they always wanted three bids on everything. And I said, well, this is the only one available, and it's in town, and I can't get three bids. They said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, um, that was a, a major issue all the time, trying to keep the publications uh, you know, efficiently operated and moving into a kind of a computer age. And actually, after I left being the advisor to the Cisco and the Raider, uh, it was taken over by people in the, um, uh, what would you call it, promotions part of the student union, the people who do all the posters and brochures and everything else, and they were all using computers. And so that's, the advising process really moved much more into the technical side of it, uh, as opposed to dealing with personnel and content and things like that. And to this day, well, the paper is still published, but it's online, it's not in print. Uh, but when I first got on campus, uh, like I say, the paper was um, letterpress and it was printed off campus. And the students would work virtually all night, the night before publication. Uh, two, three in the morning, even later, was, was not uncommon. For a short time, it was a twice a week publication. And so just once a week, which was almost most of the time. Uh, and when it was twice a week, it was even tougher to try to put out a paper and go to class and everything else they were supposed to be doing. And, and of course, it was a much smaller paper twice a week, so once a week made more sense. But when I first got on campus, I, I guess I could mention one of the funny things that happened. <laughs> I was within the first couple of days or so that I was on campus. This was in uh, July of 1969. Um, 
I parked my car on a gravel parking lot behind Central and Taylor Halls. And uh, I heard this voice. This voice says, young man, young man. And I turned around. I didn't, didn't see any other young men. So I said, well, me? <laughs> he says, yes, you. And he says, you're missing a lug nut. <laughs> I said, oh. Oh, <laughs> and he points at my car, and I look down, and I think it was the left rear tire wheel, and it was missing a lug nut. <laughs> and so I said, well, okay, th thanks. <laughs> he went his way to Taylor Hall, and I went my way to Central Hall, and uh, I got to know that man well over the next, actually, I still know him very well to this day. Um, and it's been a lot of years, but uh, I went on into Central Hall and told my new office partner about it. And he said, oh, yes, I, I know who that is. <laughs> uh, my office partner was a man named Dave Allen. I, I think his actual uh, given name was David Borum, but he happened to be in radio. And so I think he took Allen as a surname, but I'm not 100% positive of that. Probably shouldn't even repeat it, but Dave had just founded KSOR Radio within the previous two months. I think it was founded in May. And my office, I was moved in to share an office with Dave and I think also with the new service director who had just been hired and with eight or ten students who were now working on KSOR having just put it on the air. It was a madhouse. It was. <laughs> It was something else. I'm a brand new faculty member. I have no idea what's going on. And Dave's trying to put the station together. Uh, luckily, it was not during, during school uh, when I got there in, in July. So that helped a lot. But it was quite an experience having all those students around trying to figure out how to run a radio station. And it was student run. Dave founded it. But the whole idea was to have a student operated uh, station on campus. And it most certainly was. Uh, for a number of years and then it shifted away from student involvement to uh, what it became over the next 40 years and then uh, actually now they're becoming, they're bringing in more students now, much closer relationship than it had been in that huge gap between Dave and uh, the, the new director, Paul. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, that's another story. But. Uh, when I came on campus, um, we moved here from Colorado, my wife and I. And, uh, she was pregnant, so we decided to come out a couple months before school started, so to make it easier for her. And as it turned out, um, we had registration day on September 21st, when everything was not computerized. Students filled out their um, what they wanted to have in classes, and then either got it or didn't, it all on a piece of paper. And um, we were also trying to sell yearbooks, get people to sign up to buy a yearbook that day. So we had registration for classes, trying to sell yearbooks. It's pouring rain. And my wife goes to the hospital and has a baby. <laughs> and I was panicked. <laughs> I said, what is going on here? So our oldest son was born on, on registration day. Um, so that was kind of wild. <laughs> But um, I think that co kind of covers my arrival at SOU or SOC at the time. I was independent. I, was, I had no department connection, uh, and neither did, did Dave. Um, and then after, I really don't know how long it was, possibly a year, I hitched up with uh, the speech communication department. Actually, I think Dave was, was connected with that department as well. So speech and theater and at that time. And I thought that made sense um, uh, because of being media oriented and, and the radio. That's right, Dave was, was part of that department. And um, then later on it was changed to speech communication and then to communication. And uh, that, that was my affiliation. But for a little while I was a totally independent person. And in, which was very unfortunate. It was, it was difficult, you know, not really knowing who to turn to in a lot of ways. And 
Um, but it, it all worked out <laughs> eventually. I, had, I, I think I had my choice basically. It was either going to be speech theater or English. And I felt, I think because of Dave and the radio that I thought uh, the speech was a better way to go. It was a good choice. They had, you know, really great faculty. And as a, a very ironic or coincidental thing, a woman who had an office directly across the hall from me, once I moved out of KSOR, down the hall about 50 feet to where speech communication was, the woman who was directly across from me was named Karen Henderson at the time. And she was my little, one of my little sister's best friends in high school in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> and her father and my uncle were both printers. So, and they actually worked together for a little while at the Denver Post um, as printers. So it's, it's a small world. <laughs> so, and Karen and I are still very good friends. But um, a lot of my job well, both the newspaper and the yearbook were part of my teaching load. I got two, two credits out of the uh, uh, 16 that we were required to have uh, for the newspaper and two more for the yearbook. So basically I had uh, three, three or so class, real classes and then the publications as well. And the newspaper um, was, I think I might have been hired perhaps to try to steer the newspaper in a different direction. I was never actually told you know, why, I mean, that there was any problems. But when I got here, um, I realized that the paper the previous couple of years had been very, very liberal, um, very outspoken, and uh, anti-war. Uh, the editor was um, promoting the Students for Democratic Society chapter on campus. And um, I found out later on in talking to the editor, once he was former editor, that there really was no chapter, it was just he and a couple of friends. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, but the paper was quite um, liberal, um, outspoken. And uh, I came on was and... the president at the time? The president was, well, it was in transition. The president who officially hired me was Elmo Stevenson, uh, but he had just retired and Jim or James Sowers was coming in. So Sowers and I came in at the same time. Uh, and then the new editor of the Siskiyou um, had been on the staff before and um, he wasn't quite as, I hate to use the term radical, but um, uh, as energetic in that, in that direction as the previous editors. And so the paper toned itself down in a lot of ways. I, I didn't really have anything to do with it. My philosophy was, and, always has but it always will be that a student publication on a public university campus is that uh, has freedom of the press. In fact, that's what the Supreme Court says too. <laughs> so I have some backing on that and needed it at times. But um, it was their paper. And I, I advised in a, in a lot of different ways, often dealing with content, but I never controlled, ever. And I, I wouldn't, if they would have asked me to, I would have quit. So, it's, and they never did ask me to uh, directly. <laughs> uh, one president did indirectly many times, but most of the time it didn't happen. But the paper, um, uh, right off the bat, uh, we had a, a columnist, student columnist, uh, who was trying to write a column that was very cute. Uh, he tried to emulate a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle named Herb Kane. Uh, who kind of called it dot 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 journalism? A lot, of, a lot of gossip and a lot of you know, just stuff that people really interested were interested in, but didn't have a whole lot of content. <laughs> and so this our student tried to write this column, and it was it was well done at times. But he put one s small mention in the paper one day that a certain professor had just returned from a trip overseas, and as I'm trying to be nice about this. As his initials would indicate, he gets around. And the initials had some reference to a sexual disease that gets around. And that's all I'll say about that. But yeah, the, the, the comment was very, it was very clear what the student meant. 
and it was not nice. Uh, it was perhaps even insulting. Was it true? Um, I, no, it was not true at all because the reference was to something that had only to do with his initials, but the connotation was very, very negative and, and nasty. And so the professor came into the student, into the Cisco office, which um, was in the basement of Brit Hall. And he barges in, he's very upset, red-faced, and uh, I'm in there, and I think um, one or two other students are in there, and we're just chatting, which is a lot of what I did with the paper, the year would sat around and chatted. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyhow, he comes in and he says, where's this Warner? Jim Warner was the student's name. Where's this Warner kid? And I said, well, he's not here. And somebody else said, no, he's in class or something. Well, where's the editor? Uh, well, um, she's, she's not here either. <laughs> she's in class. Well, where's the advisor? Um, <laughs> well, I happened to be sitting on top of a table at the time, <laughs> chatting with the students. <laughs> and so I said, I am? <laughs> Or here, something like that. And I, by that, that point, I was very red-faced as well. And uh, so he, he was upset, obviously. And and I said, "Sir, I, I, you know, I can't do anything about that. I'll talk to him and point out that it was ill-advised and so forth. But I can't control what what he says or did say. And I'm sorry about it." And, and he grumbled and left. And we all looked at each other like, "What was that?" And I was, I was. Uh, 28 years old at the time. I was not exactly a well-versed in how to handle something like that. But, so that was my, my first experience right off the bat with the Siskiyou. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, next, maybe a year or so later, a different editor um, just was very active but on, in on-campus things. And he decided that the newspaper should evaluate faculty. Student evaluations of faculty across the country were becoming the thing. And he decided that, that the Cisco should initiate a process where the Cisco staff, well actually a, a bunch of other volunteers that helped the Cisco staff, would evaluate faculty members and print the evaluations in the newspaper. And so they did. And we talked a lot about how it should be handled, and they came up with a, I thought was a pretty good process, um, both using the statistics, you know, rating sheets, and personal interviews, um, where they would interview the faculty member and several students. Uh, the first person they interviewed was Dave Allen, happened to be my office partner, and that was a setup. We agreed that that would be the, probably the first person to interview. Uh, be more comfortable that way. And um, uh, the editor and I both felt that that would be a good positive way to start off the process. And uh, so it, it came out and nobody said much about it. And then I don't remember you know, the numbers of who was next and who was after that, but very shortly thereafter a professor was evaluated and virtually all the, inter all the uh, evaluations were very negative. Um, said all he does is talk about fishing and this and that. And so the issue came before the faculty senate. And some folks, some professors wanted the paper censored. Others wanted it censured. Uh, some said that something ought to be done about the advisor, being a faculty member. That you know. I shouldn't allow this to happen. And um, it was debated in the faculty senate and eventually tabled and never got off the table. Uh, evaluations went on for the rest of that school year. I don't recall if they actually came about the following year or not. I don't think so. I think at that point the university or the college at that time um, had developed the evaluation process itself. Uh, and it was accepted by the faculty and still exists. But uh, the, the, the problem with the one that Siskiyou did was that the, uh, the quotes from the students were often quite negative. Um, 
but they're also quite positive as well. It was a mix. It was, it was not intended to be a, a negative thing. It was intended to serve the student body. And that's the way I approached it. I told the faculty senate that, that you know, I felt they had the right to do the evaluations and they most certainly had the right to print them. And an awful lot of other faculty agreed. And as did the president of, of the college. I think the whole evaluation process, says whether it was a SISCU or just the ones that are done even nowadays, definitely helps, very definitely. And it's part of the, it's part of the process that the university, this one at least, I think most use for promotion, tenure, and so on. If, you're, if your evaluations are weak, you don't get promoted, or you shouldn't. And, uh, but that was a huge thing. Um, the same editor, he, he, was, he was so strong, I mean, he was just gung-ho. Um, he decided... Who was the editor? Um, his name was Mark Nelson. He decided that, and I'm not sure where he really got his information, but he decided to write an editorial criticizing uh, one of the chief administrators on campus. And um, who it was is, is unimportant. It wasn't the president. <laughs> but um, so he had his editorial with, I don't know, eight or ten criticisms. And he showed it to me. And he didn't have to, but he did. And, um, we talked about it for a little while, and I said, well, a lot of this is personal things. I can't see how a lot of these things um, invo involve the student body, even impact on the student body. But the funny thing about it was that our conversations, for the most part, took part in the uh, dugout at the softball field, because Mark was on the, on the soft, uh, intramural softball team, and, and I knew this editorial was coming out the next day or so in the paper, so I just went down there to the field and I said, Mark, can we talk for a while? And so we'd talk and he'd go out and play his position in the field and he'd come back to the dugout and we'd talk some more and then he'd go back and play for a while and we'd come back, talk some more. <laughs> and eventually um, the editorial was, he watered it down and it, he still ran an editorial of criticism, but it was a fair editorial and um, there was no no big concern raised about it that I'm aware of. The, the, the um, administrator did, certainly didn't say anything that ever got back to me. But um, Mark, later, after he graduated, um, became a, an aide in the state senate, I believe it was, and then shortly thereafter he began working for a lobbying firm, a public opinion polling firm. And then not very long after that, he ended up running that company in Salem. And he ran it until he retired two years ago. And I don't mind saying that he, uh, well I can quote the governor, Ted Kulingowski, said that um, he would have hired Nelson to work on his campaigns and to promote his image if he could afford him. <laughs> and another, um, another I think it was one of the governors or maybe a senator said that, in his opinion, Mark Nelson was the 31st senator in the 30-person Senate. He had that much influence. Uh, he just, he was a tremendously hard worker and uh, uh, have tremendous respect for him, even though he often lobbied for companies that I despise, but yeah, that's the breaks. <laughs> but um, he, he was a very, very good student and great editor. And other situations with the Siskiyou newspaper. Um, one time a student was running for student body president and word came to the newspaper that he, that the fellow had a criminal record. And um, so we were you know, kind of discussing whether that should be mentioned or not. And in the meantime, before it even got got to be an issue with being in the paper or not, uh, it became well known on campus. And the student did two things. One thing, he came in and threatened the editor. Uh, and he also um, quit school and went back to Sacramento. <laughs> but uh, it was very touchy there because it was a feeling that he maybe would be violent with the editor. It was, but it didn't quite get to that, or luckily it didn't. Um, 
And um, another situation, the paper several years later did a little series on poverty in, in the valley or in southern Oregon. Interviewed a lot of people who were in dire straits. Sounds like something that should be done today, actually. But, um, and ran a series of stories just about people and uh, they were in problem, had problems and what was being done about it perhaps to help them. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it got down to where one of the people interviewed, uh, we got a, 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 law, a letter from a lawyer saying this person was going to sue the newspaper for libel, for being misquoted and making her look bad and so on. And uh, luckily all the interviews were tape recorded and so we, we just wrote a letter back and said that they were on, on record, they, they were taped and the reporting was accurate and so that was the end of it. Nothing was ever heard about it again. <clears throat> I'm not sure that tape recordings would be allowed in court, but anyhow, uh, it was a little scary though, but I felt proud that the um, reporting was accurate. And once I sat down and listened to the tapes, I said, we're okay. Um, probably the most difficult time I can recall with the newspaper was um, under one college president we had, he was very supportive of the uh, football program on campus and the uh, newspaper um, thought that, that funding was, should be directed other directions than football. Um, a significant amount of student money was being pushed toward football uh, over the objection of a number of students. And um, so the paper came out against it and I had conversations with the president about it. He wanted it, basically wanted me to control it and I said I can't, I won't. And um, that was basically it. And. Um, Shortly thereafter, the same school year, um, a, a, a writer for the paper wrote an editorial criticizing this president for getting rid of, of, of another administrator who was very popular with the students. And, uh, but he had been let go by this president. And the president called the writer of the editorial into his office along with um, the two other administrators and, not, and I was not invited, was not there. And um, according to the three people who were present in addition to the president, uh, I don't want to be too, too bad about this whole thing, but it didn't go well at all. And the uh, student left in tears and the two other administrators According to what I was told by all three people, uh, spoke up for the student and for her rights. And uh, both administrators left the college shortly thereafter. One was fired and the other one uh, retired. The president moved on to another position uh, where he also ran into tremendous problems with the student newspaper. Uh, and other things happened, but it was kind of coincidental or whatever that the student paper at the other university also was on his case. <laughs> and he didn't appreciate it. I, mean, that, I probably wouldn't either, but I don't think I would have, wouldn't have treated a student like that. So, but, um, you know, that, that was some of the bad stuff that happened. There's an awful lot of good things happened. It was primarily their, uh, their training. So many of them, <laughs> There, um, so many of the students, um, you know, got excellent training not only in writing and editing and photography and all that, but also interviewing and just will be learning how to <laughs> become an adult. I mean, there's a lot to it. I mean, just learning, going out and trying to sell advertising was not easy, easy for a student. So um, it was a tremendous experience for them. Let's see if I can find them. So you can see it's a small paper. There's, this is a whole year here. So. And 
see, uh, SOC budget overestimated. Oh, here's um, this is the the um, evaluation that got the uh, faculty so upset. A hard look at a professor. But, uh, so the other ones must have been back here somewhere. Yeah, here's the first evaluation. Com prof evaluated. So journal or I mean uh, broadcasting was part of com or theater at that time. BA from Journalism at the University of Missouri. Can't do much better than that. <laughs> to find out if his name was really Alan or Warm. Yeah, it's his professor evaluation under fire. So Nelson was just basically writing a piece trying to say how they were handling it, what the philosophy was. This, man, this brings back so many memories. Bill Gabori, a history professor, gives a talk on black America. And he ended up being on the uh, FBI's blacklist, mainly because he kept going to Cuba all the time. <laughs> and he got his file, and it was all black. Everything was redacted. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> Here it is, professor evaluation process challenged by faculty senate. And uh, Mark Nelson was called before the senate to speak, or was asked to speak, it wasn't called before. So the, the good first evaluation was Dave Allen's, which was a positive, and the second one was this other professor's, which was negative. And that's why it became before the uh, faculty senate. And. Uh, Dean of Faculties spoke, and he, he basically said the Siskiyou should not discredit its pages with needless opinion without empirical data. And so uh, that was taken into consideration and, and was used. Um, Nelson, the editor, said the paper was trying to avoid a witch hunt atmosphere. Uh, the student body president spoke. He says, I do not believe the faculty is opposed to being evaluated, um, but they'd like to see some ground rules being followed. And so that's why Mark Nelson you know, pointed out what their, how it was done, and why it was done, and so forth. Um, he, one of the professors said he, uh, he commended the Siskiyou staff for finding a workable system so quickly. <laughs> that was kind of nice. Yeah. And here's what the editor wrote in response. That it is so funny that Steve Bournette was associate editor on the Siskiyou at the same time his father was a very outspoken faculty member. Here's, um, in November of that fall of 1971, the censure, censure motion was dropped by the Faculty Senate. Um, Steve Bournett wrote the article and says, the Faculty Senate was at it again Monday. <laughs> Debate on the Siskiyou's professor evaluation process stretched into a full hour. And in time, the motion to censure the Siskiyou was dropped. And uh, it goes on about that. They formed a committee to uh, 
come up with a position paper to report back to the Senate. I don't know if that ever happened or not. So that's where it kind of ended as far as a public, public um, criticism. I think the first thing to realize is that we had a tremendous advantage. I had a tremendous advantage being where I was and where I am in Ashland. For one thing, we are, the only, we are to this day, the only county in the state that has two daily newspapers. Multnomah County does not. Lane County does not. But Medford and Ashland do. We had four TV stations. They were, each one at the time was, or three at the time, were doing news. And then a fourth one came along later and doing news. So we had the, all these opportunities for students to intern both at newspapers and at the TV stations, whether they're in the broadcast side or the journalism side. And it wasn't just in this county, though it was in Klamath Falls and it was elsewhere where they could get internships. It was primarily here. And a lot, a lot of students got the chance to uh, work for papers and, and stations. And we arranged it to, not only did they get credit, but they got pay. Not much, and I'm not even sure how proper that was, but it was a good thing. Uh, it was just like a work-study job. But um, as I mentioned, Mark Nelson went on to great things. Um, let me see, uh, a student named Joe, Joe Hawk uh, was our sports editor, and he became uh, was the sports editor for the Las, Las Vegas uh, Review, Review, Review Journal. Um, uh, Jim Parker was an editor. He worked for some papers in Northern California for a while, and then uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, where he got really interested in uh, beer. <laughs> he ended up doing the reviews of the pubs and stuff like that. And Fort Collins is the home of uh, New Belgium Brewing. And uh, anyhow, um, Jim ends up moving to Oregon, becomes the director for the Oregon Brewers Association or something like that, microbrewers. Uh, but it was all connected to his interest in, in, interesting, his interest in um, writing and in beer. <laughs> but um, some other ones, uh, Jessica Robinson was both Siskiyou editor and KSOR news director. And last time I checked, she was uh, uh, working with Northwest News out of uh, Spokane, Washington. Um, who else? Um, Jeff Brady is a correspondent with National Public, with, with NPR, with All Things Considered. Uh, Morgan Holm, again, was with KSOR, um, is the vice president for content, I think they call it, with uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting, OPB. Um, well, the, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, one funny thing that happened, my wife and I were getting off an airplane in Washington, D.C., in, you know, in the airport, and we go into a lounge, and, and I hear this voice, and I say, I know that voice. I look up at the TV, and it's a former student named Rennie Knott, and he's the sportscaster for this t TV station in Washington, D.C. He's also the voice of the Washington Redskins. And uh, he moved from there to St. Louis. But he had you know, been a student. He'd been on, on a, he, no, he interned at, I think it was KOBI TV. But anyhow, it, there's all sorts of people like this. Um, Terry Claflin or Terry Martin was a student on the newspaper. She was editor and uh, became, be, began working for the Mail Tribune as an intern and then as a full-time reporter. Um, she was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for a series that she and a photographer at the paper did. Uh, she didn't get the prize, but she won a lot of you know, state and regional awards. She also got hired by us to teach journalism part-time. <laughs> um, Kathy Noah was also editor of the Cisco. She's now editor of the Mail Tribune. John Reed was editor of the Cisco. He's now he formerly editor of the Mail Tribune. Um, a whole lot of stories like that. That at one at one point, very close, if not maybe more than half of the uh, news editorial employees at the Mail Tribune had 
been on the Cisco and or been in journalism at SOU, SOC, SOSC, uh, just because of the connection with the internships primarily. And that was really great. Uh, um, I think all the sports staff had, it came from our, our place at one time. But anyhow, uh, it's really it's neat that that happened. There were some other folks, um, Mike Patrick, who was another editor of the Cisco, um, went into broadcasting. I don't think he was involved here on campus, but he, he became news director for the Christian Broadcasting Net, Network in Virginia under uh, Pat Robertson, I think it was. Um, some of the other folks, we had this one fellow that worked on the Cisco, but he ended up owning the second largest uh, coffee company in the Northwest, um, second only to Starbucks, as far as I know. So once he got out of Ashland, he did pretty well. <laughs> Actually, he had a coffee shop here in Ashland that closed a couple years ago. He was, he's a character, something else. <laughs> we had a woman, um, who was on the Cisco staff and on KSOR. Remarkable career. Um, she was just on the news staff at KSOR and uh, when Dave was still alive, Dave Allen, and Dave became ill with cancer. And Terry, Terry Danner is her name, um, not only continued to help be on the station, but she ended up teaching his classes as a student, as an undergraduate. She finished out the year for him under, I mean, she had some help obviously from some of our other faculty, but she stepped up and was teaching broadcast writing and broadcast announcing in Dave's absence when he was in the hospital. And um, she was a theater critic for the Cisco. And one time the, the uh, uh, Cisco wrote an editorial criticizing the way homecoming had been handled, managed by the student people involved. Well, Terry was also the, direct, the uh, person behind Homecoming. <laughs> so she's on the staff of the Cisco being criticized by the Cisco. <laughs> uh, there was all sorts of folks like that. Um, the student who was criticized by the college president for the editorial um, about the firing of another administrator, uh, graduated, went to uh, graduate school for her master's and her PhD, and now is a full professor at the University of Florida. I'm very, very proud of her. It was great. She, again, was one of those people that had not only intelligence, but backbone, and uh, was a tremendous student. But all sorts of folks. Um, I'm looking at a little list here. That's probably enough of them. <laughs> but the uh, newspaper, as I said, it became computerized and then moved into the student union and I left the advising part of it. Uh, the yearbook was tough. It was tough to keep it going financially because the student interest in college yearbooks was nowhere near what it is in high school as far as buying them or working on them. And eventually uh, the student government and incidental fees committee decided to uh, stop subsidizing the yearbook, stop giving extra money to add to what the students would pay when they purchased one. And that was the death knell that put the, the uh, book out of business, um, which is too bad, but it was happening all over the country. It's rare you even find a, a university yearbook nowadays. Um, but, uh, you know, for a while it lasted, it was a good experience for the students. And usually non-controversial, <laughs> not, not like the paper, which wasn't usually controversial, but it had its, its times. My only big problem I had with the yearbook was a um, personnel issue. We only had two or three photographers, and, two, and only two of them were good. And the two that were good went to a dance at the uh, Brit Ballroom, uh, drunk, <laughs> and uh, were taken out of the ballroom by security or somebody, anyhow, they were escorted out and reported to the Dean of Students for, you know, poor behavior, which it was. And um, so I immediately got wind of it. And I'm thinking, well, um, we can't really have a yearbook without photographers. <laughs> and yet they, you know, broke a number of rules. 
So I went to the Dean of Students and I said, look, we're in a real pickle here. He says, yeah, you are, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I, I don't know what we can do. And so we talked about it a long time and she, she said, okay, I'm not going to expel them, I'm not going to suspend them, but there's got to be a strong message delivered to them, and which, which she did in a variety of ways. But she, she let them and probably me off the hook, um, which I thought was very, very kind of her. And they did not misbehave the rest of the year, <laughs> which is good of them. <laughs> but uh, that was a shaky thing. But that's pretty much it as far as the publications go. It, it, it took a lot of time. I mean, even though I wasn't involved there reading every story and everything, I was mainly just by their request. And maybe if I got wind of something, I would ask if I could. But most of my time was spent with the, uh, like I said, you know, just kind of chatting and then with the uh, finances and then a lot of the personnel issues that came up um, with both publications. It wasn't, wasn't unusual. I think it took more time than probably should have, but I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the uh, interaction with the students. Uh, was, personally, that was the best part of the whole job I had at the college, I think, was interacting with students in one form or another. It's academic advising, publications advising, career advising, personal stuff. Um, that's what I liked. With the teaching, I taught one, lar one so-called large lecture class and only had 35 students in it, but at that time, that was considered large. <laughs> Nowadays, it wouldn't be. Um, and then I had the, the uh, skills classes, you know, news writing, um, editorial writing, and so forth, a copy editing. And also had a class called Press and Society, which is kind of the ethics class. Um, so those classes were all smaller and much more um, interacting with the students than the so-called lecture class was. And when I would get reviews, faculty evaluations, um, they would say, if it was a large class, they would say, boring. <laughs> and some said, uh, interesting, <laughs> but I don't think I was much of a lecturer. Whereas the small classes, it, it, they came out pretty good. Um, I developed um, a class, well, I started a mass media law class and then um, freedom of speech class. And Press and Society became mass media ethics. And those were my three favorite classes by far. I got away from the skills classes and concentrated more on these small seminar type classes. Uh, there was tremendous interchange between myself and the students and a lot of debate, discussion, uh, dealing with law or ethics. And I, and I really, really liked those classes. Um, and I was able to build up the uh, curriculum in that respect. Um, we, we had at least, at one time, at least 60 journalism majors, if you would call them that. It was a, an emphasis within the communication major. So you could, you, know, you could say, well, I want to be in small group communication, or I want to be in journalism, or I want to be something else, broadcasting. And we had a large number of students in journalism. And so I was able to do my classes, advise publications, and hire adjunct faculty to teach a lot of the skills classes. And the adjunct faculty came from the profession. And so the woman I mentioned, Terry Martin, um, at the Mail Tribune, who had been Cisco editor, came back and taught news writing, um, journalistic writing, a couple other classes for us usually one or possibly two classes a term uh, while working at the paper and then later after she left the paper. In fact, I think she may still be teaching at least one class here. Um, we had uh, Bert Fox, who was a photo editor at the Mail Tribune, uh, taught photography, photojournalism for us, which we taught in conjunction with the art department and their photography program. And um, he became photo editor for the National Geographic, which is a pretty darn high position. 
<laughs> and so he had some skills. <laughs> and so Terry and Bert were right off the bat pretty sharp people. And uh, Richard Sept, uh, editor of the Tidings, taught for us. Editor of Time at the Tidings. Uh, John Reed from the Mail Tribune taught for us. Um, who else was there? Well, other, other, other photo editors from the Tribune taught photojournalism for us. Um, I think that was about it. There have been some other ones as well. But the point was that they were all professionals. And so they're learning from the professional. They don't have to listen to some has-been, like myself, or somebody that just read about it in a book. And the other good thing about it was that the professionals coming on campus could see who the better stu students were. And that led more to the internships, which, which led to the jobs, which led to careers. And it also um, built a relationship between myself and the paper, which benefited both myself and the university. Um, I, whenever I had a sabbatical leave or, or many summers, I would work six months or three months at the Mail Tribune and whatever they wanted. So sometimes it was sports, sometimes it was business. I don't know why I ever did business. I didn't, <laughs> it wasn't my field. And I, sometimes I was the city reporter or the county reporter, whoever they needed at that time. And it was all writing and I didn't do any editing at that time. Um, but I always had that connection. So I was always sharpening my own skills, but again, connecting with the people who worked at the paper. And some, at one point I was actually a reporter under my former student, John Reed, which is kind of weird. <laughs> um, and that also I developed a relationship with the publisher, Steve Ryder. And um, he, well, his money, the Mail Tribune's money, and um, I developed the First Amendment seminars on campus. But they never would have happened had not the Mail Tribune funded them. And they basically, were, we would bring a noted media person on campus. That good. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why those seminars were important? Why those ideas um, <clears throat> warranted service? I think that there had been a history on, on campus of having speakers of national note on, on campus. Um, I'm trying to think who some were. Rod, Ster Rod Sterling uh, from Twilight Zone. Um, some other noted authors, and I'm drawing a blank on some of them, but they're very well-known authors and philosophers that have been on campus. And then that kind of died out. And there seemed to be a, a void, or at least not anywhere near as much of that as there had been. And so Steve and I were talking about trying to build or bring folks on campus that people had heard of. But one of the main reasons for it was to get community on campus. The community to come and listen to somebody that the college was putting on. Instead of this big old wall, you know, we're here, we're here for students and the community is out there doing their thing. And I think that was probably Steve's emphasis. Um, and certainly our administration was all for it. They're always looking at ways to, you know, get the community involved. And as you're probably well aware, when you do do something like that on a campus or even in the um, off campus, it's mostly community people that go. <laughs> and it turned out that these were very, very popular with the community. Student body, so-so, they're somewhat interested, especially if they were in journalism or something like that. But the, the, Brit, uh, the Stevenson Union Rogue River Room was packed for these events and uh, it was probably 80% community. But our first speaker, once you know, Steve got the funding together and we figured out who we wanted to ask, our first speaker was Fred Friendly, uh, president of CBS News. And that was a real coup. I'm very happy about that. Um, he, he came and at, he was, uh, of course, his whole interest was uh, the Constitution. Steve Ryder, mid-80s? I'm not positive about that. 
that's very, it's likely been around that that time. Um, he, Fred had left CBS at that point. I know that, but he came on campus, and his wife um, was his. Um, she did everything for him other than speak. She set up the trip. She, you know, everything as far as the logistics. She she did a fantastic person. She's she's still living in in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we exchange cards every year. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. But um, yeah, he came on campus and he had his, this little pocket-sized copy of the Constitution, and he gave his talk. And he went around, you know, asking people about this or that, this right or that right, you know. And, well, do you think that's a, should that be a right or not? And he was right in everybody's face, and he was, he was wonderful. And the audience just, oh my gosh, <laughs> he was a CBS News president talking to us. <laughs> and we had several other, um, you know, folks after that. It it didn't last very long, maybe seven years or something. Um, Steve retired as publisher, the paper changed hands two or three times, and yeah, the funding was no longer there. And so the, for, the uh, seminars died, or the forum is a better word to put it. But that was a really nice thing when I was here. Dave Frohnmeyer, former attorney general in Oregon, ran for governor, uh, moderated our first two or three that we did, and then he had to he had to not moderate when he was running for governor. I felt that was a conflict of interest. But he was another wonderful person, a big supporter of our, our program. But um, we, we did those um, types of things. Uh, this is all kind of tied in with the teaching. Uh, and, and the speakers would come to classes too and speak. That was part of the deal. Uh, it was in the contract. Of course, and I think that happens when anybody comes on campus, at least it should. The journalism program got quite big. We had the adjunct faculty. Um, we had another fellow named um, uh, Russell Sadler um, taught as an adjunct for us. He was a political columnist um, syndicated across the state, uh, speaker. He spoke all over the place, very knowledgeable of Oregon history and Oregon politics and uh, very influential. He even was involved in a couple of lawsuits, um, I think, uh, regarding open records in state government. But Russell came down, when I took one of my sabbatical leaves, Russell came down at the request of the president of the college at that time who knew of him. I didn't really know much about him. But um, we talked to Russell and President Cox says this would be a good guy. So he came down and did taught while I was on sabbatical. And then he stayed on as an adjunct faculty member uh, for several years. He was very popular with the students. And uh, so he was a very good addition. And it helped us fill the need uh, for the students. And um, then after I left, uh, we hired two people, um, D.L. Richardson, a young man out of Alabama, uh, to uh, teach, and also Paul Steinle, who was uh, much more experienced than, than DL in a variety of ways, in newspapers and in television. He'd been news director at, I think it was KING, or one of the Seattle stations, TV stations, had a long newspaper background as well. So the combination of both those professionals coming in was very good for the program. Uh, and they were much different, and, which was also good, I think, for the program. But um, as the years kind of went by, um, computers became a much bigger, bigger deal, and people began to think, well, you don't have to, you don't need journalism anymore. Uh, DL resigned, um, and so the program fell just to Paul, who then moved into administration um, as associate provost. And so the combination of two things was happening. We were losing faculty, and we were losing program um, because of the attitude that uh, you didn't need to have writers primarily, at least not journalistic writers, which I think is crazy. Um, whether it's, you know, on the internet, uh, blogs, in newspapers that are in print or on the internet, whatever it is, 
there's always a need for good writers. But now things have become just so technical and uh, creative in a different sense. So that's why the program has basically merged into another program on campus and it's nothing like it used to be. And I think it's a sad thing. Um, but that's the way it was. It is. <laughs> um, myself, I, you know, after I continued, or after I retired from, well, maybe before I retired from teaching, and while I was teaching, I was involved a lot in the, student, or in the campus governance uh, as a faculty member, uh, which was another interest I've had and, uh, and really enjoyed that part of it, as, in addition to the teaching the smaller classes and advising, whether it was a faculty senate or the faculty union, whatever it might be, it was a lot of fun and sometimes not so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> but all in all, it was a very good experience. Um, and then I, you know, I finally resigned or retired and uh, did the part-time teaching for a while and went off to other things. And that was it. <laughs>